Oh, well, hey there. Welcome to my podcast. This is your host, Rebecca Warfield, and I am just starting my first podcast for those of you out there who are interested in a little bit of yoga, a little bit of life, you know, a little bit of whatever is just on my mind lately. Not so much that what's on my mind in the narcissistic way, but you know, just things that are happening and how it can apply to yoga, or maybe it doesn't because to be honest, I am a yogi and a yoga practitioner and a yoga teacher, but it doesn't have to be all yoga all the time. Although it's nice when it is some yoga. I started this podcast really from my inspiration of a few podcasts that I really like, such as My Favorite Murder. Um, And you might be thinking, murder? Uh, Yeah, murder. Who doesn't like a good true crime murder story? That brings me to my episode today, Blinded by the Love and Light, because there's this modern notion that yogis are all love and light all the time. Um, In fact, for some reason, I've even felt a little weird telling my yoga clients and other yoga teachers that I like a podcast called My Favorite Murder and that I even went to one of their live shows because often people think like murder, yogis can't be into murder. Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm a murderino and I like yoga and that's that. And there's a lot of people out there who like practicing yoga and want to be a part of a yoga community, but feel like they can't fit in because they're not all love and light all the time. So here's the deal. Enough with the love and light already. Don't get me wrong. I like love. I like light. I like peace and I like blessings. But if we are constantly saying that, oh, to be a yogi, you have to be love and light and positive all the time, we are neglecting the complications of the world. And after all, the whole yoga practice is designed to unravel those complications so we can get back to the true self. So if we're ignoring these complications, if we're like, oh, nope, can't have any negativity, peace, love, blessings, love and light, namaste, we have neglected the work that needs to be done within ourselves. Um, And by the time you're listening to this, it's February, hopefully February 1st, but for me, it's January 17th. And so you might be thinking like, okay, cool, it's Valentine's Day, and you're all like Debbie Downer over here saying like we can't have love and we can't have light. And it's not exactly what I'm saying. But I am saying that if we completely saturate ourselves in this concept of artificial love, not true love, not the love that maybe the ancient yogis were, well, I shouldn't say ancient, even the modern yogis are exploring, but the ones that the ancient yogis speak of, this knowing of the soul, this oneness, we have really veered from that. So when we talk about love, really what we're doing is talking about this hallmark version of love. And I don't really feel like talking about that. Although I will sit down and eat some chocolate with you and drink some wine. Um, That sounds like a good plan for Valentine's Day. I really want to talk about the opposite of love, the opposite of love and light. And if someone were to ask you or to ask me right now, hey, what's the opposite of love? I think we could all come up with a lot of different answers. Hate, war, indifference. Everyone has their own personal answers for that. But for me, the answer when I think of the opposite of love would be the lack of clarity. Because if I'm not clear, I can't respond to things compassionately because I'm too wrapped up in my own confusion. And I don't necessarily mean confusion with like, oh my gosh, is he going to text me? Is he not going to text me? Because I'm not talking about that sort of love. I'm talking about this deeper sense of oneness. If I feel confused or conflicted, I can't love in the way that sees other people as one. And so that ends uh, ends up with a lot of confliction and confusion on my part. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not bad to feel a lack of love or it's not bad to feel confusion or indifference because that's part of life. Conflict is always going to be a part of life, which means it can't be all love and all light all of the time. It's just as simple as that. After all, if you look at the statues of Patanjali, there's often a conch shell because the conch shell was blown in ancient times as a way to signal that war has begun. And so Patanjali has this conch shell because, hey, the war has begun. The war has 
always begun and the war will always be. So if we pretend like we are not in constantly trying to negotiate and navigate our way through conflict, whether that be external or internal, we are really neglecting the human experience. And without unpacking and unraveling that conflict, we're really not doing our job as yogis. There's some really weird stuff about what yogis should and shouldn't be. They shouldn't listen to podcasts about murder. They shouldn't talk about, oh, you know, screw love and light. Let's talk about hate and conflict, Um, which is kind of weird, you know, that we're held to this standard of like always being this token of positivity. Um, And I, you know, an example I have of this is a few months ago, I started kickboxing at a gym called Nine Round here in Wilmington, North Carolina that I love. It's super fun. You get to put on, like wrap your hands and you put on gloves and punch punching bags. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, And so I went to this kickboxing class a few times and then I went to work and I work at a a university here in North Carolina in the English department. And I was telling my colleagues at lunch, I said, oh man, I went to this kickboxing class today and it was awesome. And a professor who's sort of notorious for just starting conflict for the sake of conflict, um, he's not necessarily made of love and light. (laughs) He was like, "Uh, don't you think that's the opposite of yoga? And I said, no, not at all. I guess I didn't think about it as the same or opposite, you know, I do yoga and then I went to kickboxing and he was like, well, it just seems a little violent for a yogi. Yeah, sure. Yogis are designed, uh, I shouldn't say designed, yogis hope to practice ahimsa non-harming, but that is a practice, right? But I told him, hey, wait a minute, punching a punching bag isn't violent. So I took a little poll at lunch that day because, you know, professors come in and out of the department and have lunch. And everyone that came in, I said, hey, do you think kickboxing is the opposite of yoga? And every single person said yes, which kind of blew my mind. And someone said, you know, it just seems a little violent or not very peaceful to be punching something. And I told them, I said, well, hey, you know, actually, it depends on your intention." You know, if you're punching something to be a jerk, yeah, sure, that might be the opposite of yoga, but my intention is to have a good time and take care of my body. So that's not really the opposite of yoga. And I said, it's really about what you intend to do with what you're doing. And he said, oh, okay, so that means that if you have, quote, good intentions, you can be unintentionally racist, which I'm not sure how we got there. That's like the true academic style, like from kickboxing to racism, which I mean, that's fine. I'm down for complicated conversations. I like analysis, but it was sort of a a quick change. But even then I said, no, because the yogi, when he or she is intentional, it's with clarity. It's not blind intention. So when we can act out of clarity, we can have intention that embodies that love and light, but it's pure. It's not a way for us to just ignore things that are happening. Happening. It's not a way for us to spiritually bypass. It's a way for us to really look at the world and act in a way out of pure intention. How we got there out of kickboxing, I have no idea, but that's where we ended up. But what it's a reminder of is that the world is complex and the world has violence. And sometimes we will be a part of that violence. And we're reminded of this if we read the Bhagavad Gita. You may or may not have read the Bhagavad Gita. For those of you not familiar with it, it's the Song of God. And it's the story about a a guy named Arjuna, and he's on the battlefield with his charioteer, who just so happens to be Krishna, which is like kind of cool, you know. But Arjuna is on the battlefield, and Krishna reveals himself to him, and Arjuna's like, dude, what the fuck? I have got to fight this battle, and the people I'm going to have to kill are my family members. They're my teachers, my friends, my neighbors, these people who are important to me. Unfortunately, these people who are important to me are about to do bad things to the kingdom, but I don't want to kill them. And Krishna says, hey, you got to do what you got to do. In fact, he says, he calls it Dharma, right? It's the Dharma sometimes is translated as like your path, which it's more complicated for that. And I don't necessarily want to get on a huge conversation about Dharma right now, but he says, considering your Dharma, you should not vacillate. For a warrior, nothing is higher than a war against evil. 
The warrior confronted with such a war should be pleased, Arjuna, for it comes as an open gate to heaven. But if you do not participate in this battle against evil, you will incur sin, violating your dharma and your honor. So here, really what he's saying is you have to do what has to be done, even if that means we have to engage in a war. And it's a reminder that the world is complicated and we're always going to be in this constant state of war, the war within, a war with your mom, right? a war with your neighbor. It, it could be anything, but it's complex. But if we are in the midst of that complication without clarity, we cannot approach it with good intentions. Love and light doesn't do shit unless you know what you are using that love and light for. So in the case of Arjuna, he had to follow this path of being a warrior and being a part of this war, killing his family and his teachers and his cousins and friends because it would save the kingdom. And that's not love and light in the way that gets to just, that allows us to bypass the things that are complicated and difficult in life. It's the love and light that makes the world a better place when you have finished doing what needs to be done. And here's the thing. Sure, love is a thing we do. It's something we experience and it's great and it's fun when we're talking about that sort of surface level love. But in the yogic sense, love is a state of being. It's a place where we end up with clarity, where we understand the conflict of the world and we know what to do about it and we do something. But That state of love, it's also impermanent, which is why we practice. It's why that conflict continues to arrive. And the more we practice it, the easier it becomes to then come back into that place of steadiness or stasis where we're not high and we're not low. We're just experiencing, hopefully in the yogic sense, that state of oneness or what is often called bliss, or I just like to call it peace, where I just don't feel like everything's so complicated all the time. So for this Valentine's Day, what I wish for you is sure a whole lot of love, but also a whole lot of conflict because the better we get at working through our conflicts, the easier it is to experience this sort of love that the yogis are talking about. Um, And that wraps up episode one. Remember, these are my musing, not truths about yoga for the modern world. So um, I hope that they're meaningful to you. But, you know, ideas change. We as humans, we too are impermanent. So I I hope that you don't necessarily think that this is the this is the truth. This is it. Let me go out into the world and tell everyone. It's something to consider. Musings, not truths. If you have something to share or to contribute, please let me know. I'm excited to hear about it. And I look forward to hosting another podcast for you soon. Bye.